From all that I've heard, the queen is not necessarily interested in fashion so much as she knows the power of clothing and how it's part of her duties. I think what we see with this season of The Crown is uh, that the queen is entering middle age, and that's not something we see you know, often in various television series or movies. You have this direct contrast between an aging queen and you know the young princess as she bursts onto the scene. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Holmes. I'm a journalist and the creator of So Many Thoughts on Instagram, where I parse the royal fashion of the Duchess of Cambridge and the Duchess of Sussex. You probably know them as Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle. I am also now the author of a new book called HRH, So Many Thoughts on Royal Style, which looks at the fashion of Kate and Meghan, along with the Queen and Diana. I think when you think about royal fashion, the Queen perhaps is not the most fashionable one to come to mind, but I'm here to make a case for why she sort of set the stage for the royal fashion that we watch today. I think the queen walks that very difficult line of fancy and frugal so well. She recognizes that looking the part of the queen is a big, big part of her job. So many people can close their eyes and picture her immediately, and that's because early on she devised this uniform. And what I admire is that when you look at her clothing, it's fashion, but it's really function. Um, everything about what she is wearing is designed to sort of help her carry out her duties. So you'll notice the bright colors, those are so she can be spotted in a crowd or, you know, or on a balcony. Her hats are big enough to sort of make a statement, uh, but they're never too big that they would obscure her face. Through her life, she's had several influential uh, sort of brand building, image making design partners. Early on, it was Norman Hartnell who designed her wedding dress and her coronation gown. And now in, her, in the later part of her life, it's Angela Kelly, who is her senior dresser and confidant. And most of her wardrobe, the bulk of it, is bespoke. The queen was just seen in a mask that was supposedly an Angela Kelly design. <laughs> so I think anything that she needs, there's a whole team of people waiting to make it for her. In researching for my book, HRH, I was thrilled to learn about these early fashionable years. You know, and I think she learned from her father early on that the public presence of the monarch was really important. And certainly as a woman, the expectations around her dressing the part were really high. And in those early years, she wore really beautiful, really feminine pieces. So you have to remember that the queen was never meant to be queen, right? Her father was the second son. And then when her uncle abdicated, her family was sort of thrust into the spotlight. After the war, they decided that, that Britain needed a pick-me-up. And the queen and her sister Margaret were positioned as the princesses that were part of the fairy tale. She understood that people want the fairy tale and part of her job was to deliver on it. So the queen's wedding dress came at a time of rationing, and so she had to collect ration coupons, and people from all over the country sent theirs to her to try and help, which is such a, I think, a charming thing that people wanted to contribute to this dress. And that was not legally allowed, so she sent them back with a thank you note. And what I find so charming is that all the things we think about with royal wedding dresses today, the guessing game around it, it was all there back then too, when she got married. There's something just so enticing about a royal wedding and the fairy tale that it holds. She ascended to the throne when she was just 25 years old. She was a very young woman in a male-dominated world, you know, taking on sort of the globe with this greater mission. I think her coronation look is her most glamorous, and I think, you know, that was a year in the making. And the dress was designed by her wedding dress designer, Norman Hartnell, and he said it, you know, it was the most important dress of, that he'd ever designed. And he's, he's right, you know what I mean? That dress is so filled with meaning and symbolism. It was sort of the base for all the regalia that she had on top of it, but still the dress stood on its own. Around the hem, it, um, was, it was embroidered with symbols from throughout the Commonwealth. When Megan got married in 2018 and she had that beautiful statement veil that was embroidered with, again, the symbols from the Commonwealth, a lot of people drew connections between her veil and the Queen's coronation gown, and I thought that was so thoughtful. And you have to remember that the monarchy you know, relies on the public support, right, for its continued existence. And so people have to like them, they have to want them. And I think clothing helped her do that. And then certainly, um, 
As she progressed, um, she devised this more sort of sensible uniform. They were brightly colored and very sensible. I do think that as Diana entered the picture in the early 80s, the queen started to recognize that perhaps she should up her fashion game too. And it took a minute for that to happen. But in the 90s, her hues got even brighter and her clothes got a little more uh, fitted, a little more tailored. And you know, the queen that we follow today, I think her look is iconic. I think what we see with this season of The Crown is uh, that the queen is entering middle age. She was sort of aging in front of everybody. And the fashion there is really notable because, you know, the queen is wearing her sensible skirt suits and they look in comparison to Diana, sort of a little fusty. And Diana broke the mold in so many ways, including with what she wore. And you can see the queen sort of take note of all of that. And I think that contrast, that tension is really interesting. And there was one tour of Canada um, that she went on in the early 80s and the critics noticed that you know they were not impressed uh, with the way that she showed up and it was not that razzle dazzle that they expected and they said as much but she took note her suits got a little bit more tailored and a little bit more fitted the ways in which she self-corrects I think are um, really important you know when I was watching the season of the crown I was kind of amazed at how little I noticed what Olivia was wearing and you definitely get this sense of you know she's getting older and more settled in her role and more sort of stepping back from the public spotlight, not in terms of power, but in terms of attention. This is the queen as a mother as who's trying to sort of sort out the next generation and try and understand how much of their drama falls to her and is her responsibility to manage. And I think her wardrobe, you know, I mean, you see somebody who's sort of comfortable in life and it's not in any way flashy or all that memorable even. And I think therein lies part of the problem. So what I was fascinated by in researching my book, HRH, is I spent a lot of time digging through pictures of the queen and you see her in the 80s and early 90s and she is looking sort of older and a little bit more subdued. And suddenly in the late 90s, it's like she enters this sort of technicolor Oz because she began working with her senior dresser, Angela Kelly. Kelly has a supposedly a very frank um, assessment of the queen's wardrobe in the early 90s and helped her sort of recalibrate. They're not necessarily like huge, you know, swings of the pendulum by any means, but suddenly the colors, the pinks get brighter, you know, and the yellows get sunnier and the clothing gets a little bit more fitted and certainly more uniform. The adornment on her hats, the embellishments there get a little bit more whimsical and all of it combined to sort of a really profound effect. She is now in her mid nineties and there are so many ways in which she could look remote or old. And these really bright colors and very recognizable fashion keep her feeling fresh. They keep her feeling relatable and fun and sort of a reason to see, you know, what's the queen wearing today? So if you wanted to dress like the queen, the first thing you need is a beautifully bright colored coat. She often wears coats that fall just below her knees. And then underneath, she'll wear a sort of a sensible shift dress. And then around her neck, she wears pearls, often three strands at a time. On her feet, she wears sensible, often black, black heeled loafers. She likes to wear hats that are big enough to sort of make a statement. Again, they help her sort of pop in the crowd, but not so big that they would ever obscure her face. And the hats are often embellished with feathers or flowers. Again, it adds to sort of her whimsical appearance. So for someone who's the queen, she doesn't wear a crown all that often. The um, royal family sees jewelry as sort of a display of power and wealth and influence, and the queen has always bought into that. And so it's not just a tiara, but it's some real, <laughs> real pop in the earrings and a statement necklace and you know a couple of bracelets too. She'll often wear white um, when she does that, so as to sort of let the jewelry shine. And so every time I see the queen sort of covered <laughs> in her jewels, I think, you know, this is what makes her the queen. You know, I mean, certainly the jewels don't make her the queen, but she is the one person with access to all of this and uh, what fun that would be. But it's just a reminder. You know, I mean, there's very few people in this world that have a tiara, <laughs> let alone a whole collection of them. The queen has introduced this concept that the royals are fancy and frugal. And she was raised again during very austere times and her whole sort of inner circle instilled in her the importance of, you know, mending your clothes and, you know, hanging things up at the end of the day. And I think that's um, another reminder that the royal family is walking a very fine line in the public eye. They have to be responsible stewards, you know, of the taxpayer money that they receive. And I think 
people want them to be fancy at times, but they also want to just be um, these relatable, you know, very frugal touches that they have. And the queen, you know, she wears, <laughs> she wears clothes more than once. You know, she holds onto shoes and bags for a long time. It's very relatable. I, I, I definitely think that you see Kate and Will carry that mantle. You know, I mean, you see Kate dress the kids in hand-me-downs. Kate, you know, wears a lot of the same sort of similar styles over and over again. You see it all as, you know, building to something. And that's when I think, oh yeah, the queen did this first. I think the queen should get more credit for being her own version of a fashion icon. There's really something to be said for devising a unique and personal uniform. I'm not saying that everybody should run out <laughs> and start wearing brightly colored hats or coats, you know, but coming up with a look that is sort of specific to you and that people can identify with you. And when you close your eyes, you can picture the queen and there's real power in that. It's sort of like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's collars because long after she's gone, we're gonna remember what she looked like. There's nobody that dresses like her and there's nobody that ever will. That's true fashion power to me.